This past week, I was out shopping, and I thought I would try a new shampoo. (laughs) The one I selected had on the bottle that it gave hair body and bounce. So I thought I would give it a try, and I must admit that I'm a little disappointed that (laughs) none of you have come up to me and said, hey, Billy, isn't there something different about you today? Can it be that your hair has more body and bounce? Maybe some of you were thinking it, just never got around to sharing it with me. Or you may be thinking, Billy, it would be a little easier to tell if you had more hair. But the bottle did not specify any conditions. It didn't say you had to have a certain amount of hair in order for it to have body and bounce. I'm not exactly sure what it means for hair to have body and bounce. The word body has different meanings in the English language. I have a body, you have a body. We are spiritual beings with bodies. There's the body of a car, the body of stars, the body of a paper you write for school. Used in this way, the word body is a noun. But I think the marketing department for this shampoo is referring to the adjective form of the word, as in the body of a good wine, which refers to its richness, its fullness. The word bounce also has different meanings. When we hear the word bounce, we usually think of someone bouncing a ball or He's going to bounce up and down on the trampoline. But again, the hair company is going with its adjective form, which means vitality, liveliness, spirit. He's got some bounce in his step. Liveliness, spirit in his step. All of these adjectives, richness, Fullness, vitality, liveliness, spirit. All of these should be part of the Christian experience. Jesus said, I have come so you may have life and have it in its fullness, its richness, its vitality. I have come so that you may have body and bounce. Now one important ingredient to enable us to have this kind of life, to have body and bounce, of course, is faith. So how do we get more faith? The disciples were asking Jesus that in the gospel reading that Susan read. Increase our faith, Lord. When I moved to New York after college to pursue a career in theater, I was scared to death. If I had my druthers, I would have stayed home in Savannah or somewhere in Georgia, close to home. But back in the early 1980s, you had to go to New York if you hoped to have a performance career in theater. It would have been really strange to spend four years of college studying this stuff and not doing anything with it. So I had to go to New York. But I only knew a few people there, and I didn't have any connections, and I wasn't a member of the Actors Union Equity, and I was wondering, how long can I pay rent? 
not knowing if I could handle this very long, not knowing if I would want to go back home pretty soon, I did not buy or invest in a bed. I bought an army cot, which is about the stupidest thing I've ever done in my life. What was even stupider was where I bought the army cot from, which is another story for another book. By the way, do not sleep on an army cot for a year. Your back will never be the same. As I entered this new and scary world, every night I would turn to the scriptures, especially the four Gospels. Every night I would saturate myself with the stories of Jesus and his teachings. I focused on them like I had never focused on them before. I just wish Jesus had said, go ye and buy a new bed. <laughs> I also found a church right down the block from me that saturated me with biblical passages like I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. This saturation of Scripture was transforming. I felt like I could do anything, tackle anything. Those early years in New York of saturating myself with the stories and teachings of Jesus were life-changing. They built up my faith. Our text today from Colossians says, keep your roots deep in Jesus Christ. Build your lives on Him and become stronger in your faith. It works. So read and study the teachings and stories of Jesus. And also read and study the stories of the other ancestors of our faith, people like Abraham and Sarah, David, Esther, Paul. And if you read the stories of these spiritual giants, you will discover that they were very human they made lots of mistakes. They had many weaknesses. But as our friend Rabbi Haas reminds us that the reason these stories were written in a way that reveals all of the foibles of these spiritual heroes is because the texts are saying to us, look, these people had lots of problems and issues they had lots of weaknesses, but they became spiritual giants, and that means you can too. Mary Lou Walner was raised in the church, a church she had no voice in as a woman, but a church she cherished. She didn't study the scriptures herself. She acted like a sponge and soaked up the information given to her by church leaders, most of whom were older, conservative, white men. She became a devoted disciple of people like James Dobson, Pat Robertson, and Jerry Falwell. In 1988, her oldest daughter, Anna, who was a college student, wrote her mother, Mary Lou, a letter letting her know, telling her that she was a lesbian. This stunned Mary Lou. She physically got sick, had to go to the restroom, and then she wrote Anna a letter. And part of it said this, undoubtedly the most difficult part of your letter was the gay thing. I will never, capital letters, never accept that in you. I feel it is a terrible waste, besides being spiritually and morally wrong. 
For reasons I don't quite fathom, I have a harder time dealing with this issue than almost anything in the world. I do continue to love you, but I will always hate this, and I will pray every day that you change your mind and attitude. As you might imagine, Anna did not take this letter very well, and the relationship between mother and daughter became strained. The relationship endured eight stormy years until 1996 when Anna said she didn't want to have any more contact with her mother. And then the following year, in 1997, Anna was found hanging from the bar in her closet. Anna's death started an incredible journey for Mary Lou. She started doing research on her own about homosexuality, no longer satisfied with the pat answers she'd been given by church leaders. She started doing her own biblical study and research, and she came to a very, very different conclusion. And now Mary Lou is one of the leading advocates for gay rights. She's on the front lines all of the time. She travels all over the country trying to educate people about the consequences of homophobia. She writes, no matter what else happens in my life, I will always acknowledge the pain and tragedy of Anna's suicide. However, her death has also brought me face to face with the untruth I have been taught throughout my life by the church. My transformation has occurred through a wonderful gift given to me by God, getting to know, understand, and love LGBT people. I am now proud to call myself an ally and am honored to count these children of God amongst my closest and dearest friends. This new awareness has been supported through intense study of biblical passages as well as continued dialogue with individuals on both sides of the issue. I had the great pleasure of meeting Mary Lou about 12 years ago, we were on a panel together when she visited Savannah for an event to support LGBT folks. She's an incredible person, an incredible spirit. She is full of body and bounce. She got that body and bounce by studying the scriptures. Do not be afraid to go out into deep water. Stretch, grow. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a liberating gospel that will strengthen your faith. The other thing I encourage you to do to strengthen your faith is to experience God in nature. Two weekends ago at Epworth by the Sea, some of us heard theologian Matthew Fox remind us that the two main ways Jesus and his followers experienced God was through the scriptures and through nature. Today we sang for the beauty of the earth, for, for the glory of the skies, for the beauty of each hour of the day and of the night, hill and vale and tree and flower, sun and moon and stars of light. Lord of all, to these we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. The choir sang, this is my Father's world. He shines in all that's fair. In the rustling grass, I hear him pass. He speaks to me everywhere. Matthew Fox said that the early church experienced God through scripture and nature. Think of the Celtics. Celtic Christianity. But during the age of enlightenment, when science was developed, Scripture and nature were divided up. Scripture was given to the church, and nature was given to science. And we have been paying for it ever since. For when the church lost the sacredness of the earth as a gift from God, as a revelation of God, then there was nothing wrong with abusing it. We don't have long to reclaim the sacredness of the earth before it's too late. 
But if we do, we can save it, our species and the rest of creation. It has been said that we will not save what we do not love. It is also true that we will neither love nor save what we do not experience as sacred. Unfortunately, the natural world is seen primarily as a commodity, something to be bought and sold. It's something for human beings. It's for our use. It's not seen as a sacred reality to be communed with in wonder, in beauty, and intimacy. Only the sense of the sacred will save us. And it's also what can help strengthen our faith. The late great Rabbi Joshua Heschel said, the awareness of the divine begins with wonder, with what he called radical amazement. What can give us radical amazement better than nature? When talking about the universe, science no longer tells us that we're talking about a few hundred billion galaxies. That sounds unbelievable, right? But now they are saying it is two trillion galaxies, each with hundreds of billions of stars. There are more stars in the universe than there are grains of sand on all the beaches of the earth, Matthew Fox told us. The God of the universe made you. The God of existence made you. That has to uplift you and strengthen you and your faith. We're hoping to have a public showing of a new documentary on the life of the great theologian, pastor, and Christian mystic Howard Thurman, who in my estimation doesn't get nearly enough recognition and attention He was the mentor and one of the main inspirations of Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement. It said that he was a spiritual genius who transformed persons, who transformed history. We have much to learn from Howard Thurman and his life and writings. He had a great reverence for nature, and as a child he used to like to talk to an oak tree. It was right by his house, and he'd share his triumphs and his sorrows with it. He wrote about this experience. I needed the strength of that tree, and like it, I would hold my ground. I cultivated a unique relationship with the tree. I could sit my back against the trunk and feel the same peace that would come to me in my bed at night. I could reach down in the quiet places of my spirit, take out my bruises and my joys, unfold them and talk about them. I could talk aloud to the oak tree and know that it understood. It too was a part of my reality, like the woods, the night, and the pounding surf, my earliest companions giving me space. Last Sunday, I talked about my primitive Baptist grandmother, Hester, who spent her later years living on the May River in Bluffton, South Carolina, and how every week, year after year, she would get up early and drive from Bluffton to Savannah to teach a 10 o'clock Sunday school class over at Epworth Methodist Church. That seems like it would be hard to do, but my grandmother lived on one of the prettiest places on the planet. It's incredible there. The sunrises and sunsets are breathtaking. You feel the greatness of God at low tide, at high tide, and in the changing of the tides as you gaze out across the river in the marsh. She experienced so much of God seven days a week, I'm sure she was bursting at the seams to share God with others every Sunday. And she was. Experiencing God in nature can build up your faith. So where do you go to refuel with God's spirit and inner wisdom? Where and when do you pause to capture moments of awe and radical amazement? What experience of nature gets you in touch with the presence of God and strengthens you to face the challenges in life? 
So to strengthen our faith, to live with body and bounce, we could build up our faith by connecting with God through Scripture and nature. And by the way, both of those experiences also include prayer and meditation. Prayer and meditation with the Scripture. Prayer and meditation with nature. But, but, Let us also listen to the words of Jesus in our text from Luke today. After his disciples ask him to increase their faith, he says, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Fred Craddock says of this passage that it is best translated this way. If you had faith, And you do. I mean, you know how small a mustard seed is? Don't you think you have that faith? (laughs) He says, it should be translated, if you had faith and you do. Jesus' response is not a reprimand for an absence of faith, but an affirmation of the faith that they have and an invitation to live out the full possibilities of that faith. Even the small faith they already have should cancel out words such as impossible and absurd and puts them in touch with the power of God. In other words, you may not think you have much faith, but Jesus says you already have enough to do great things, so get busy. And in the next verse, he seals the deal By saying, if you have less faith, even, even if you have less faith than the hair on Billy Hester's head, you can still live with body and bounce. (laughs) Barbara Brown Taylor says that we waste a great deal of time and energy looking for the key to the treasure box of more, thinking we need more. All we lack, she says, is the willingness to imagine that we already have everything we need. Jesus is saying you have enough. Don't let your desire for more keep you from taking action and doing great things. Just get busy. Take take action and trust God. Howard Thurman said it this way, and it's become one of his more famous quotes. Oprah Winfrey quoted it the other day. He said, don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and go do it. Because what the world needs is people who can come alive. What the world needs is people with body and bounce. And you've got it. So do it. Amen and amen.